The Sinnoh region introduced some awesome water Pokemon, so I decided to try a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond with only water types. Here's how it went. Before I start, let me know who your favourite water type is. There are some icons to choose from, like Gyarados, Empoleon, and B-Barrel. If you're not familiar with the hardcore Nuzlocke rules, I'll leave them in the description. Just know, if a Pokemon faints, it is gone for good. I also can't overlevel my team, and can only catch one Pokemon per route. With that out of the way, let's get started. I mean, I love the Chansey show as much as anyone, but I just find it a little repetitive, personally. Down by the lake, I pick the water type starter Piplup and give it the nickname Pingu. My mum tells me that Professor Rowan is intimidating and then gives me some running shoes. I can only guess that these are to run away from him if he tries to attack me. Please don't eat me. After heading north to Jubilife, I find this shady guy and his clowns and they give me a poke etch. The poke etch has all kinds of useful apps like the time, a calculator, and one that showcases the sponsor of this video, Boxu. Boxu takes delicious, authentic snacks from Japan and sends them directly to your door. But more than that, Boxu gives you a genuine Japanese cultural experience just in the tastiest way possible. I tried Boxu and absolutely loved it. My favorite was the apple caramel cookie from the Aomori Prefecture in northern Japan. I also had it with the Ashigara green tea, which was by far the best green tea that I've had since I last visited Japan. You can't get this quality anywhere else. Trust me, you just have to try it. It could be for you, a friend, or family member, and with the holiday season just around the corner, a Boxu subscription is the gift that keeps on giving with a new box every month, each having a cool new theme to explore. On top of that, you'd also be gifting them a chance to win free tickets to Japan. Boxu is hosting a giveaway for a free set of tickets for one lucky winner. To enter, all you need to do is be subscribed to Boxu before December 31st, and you'll automatically be entered. I'll include a link in my description so you can check out the terms and conditions and other methods of entry. So, for a premium Japanese cultural experience, click the link in the description and use the code KeeganJ10 to receive a generous discount. You'll get the tastiest snacks that you can't get anywhere else, all while supporting this channel. Happy snacking! After grabbing a fishing rod, I head on down to Route 204 where I cast a line, and I'm able to catch Nemo the Magikarp. But for now, it's about as useful as a fork is for eating soup. Once I reach Route 203, my rival wants a battle. He has a grass type, but it doesn't know any grass type moves. Since Piplup knows Charm, I use this to lower Turtwig's attack to minus 6 and then slowly chip away at it, giving me the win. After traveling to Auroberg City, I can take on Rourke, the first gym leader. A single water gun from Piplup is able to take Geodude down in one shot. Onyx survives one turn due to its sturdy ability, but only sets up Stealth Rock and falls on the next turn. Kranidos is next, and this guy is a real problem. It only uses Leer on turn 1, but a water gun from Piplup falls just short of taking it down. Kranidos does use Headbutt on the next turn, but Piplup just survives and one more water gun gives me the win and the very first badge. I can now use the HM for Rock Smash, and use this to access the lower level of the Auroberg Gate. It's here that I'm able to catch Daffy the Cider. After slapping some bowl cutted Galactic Grunts, Piplup evolves into Prinplup, who carries on the tradition of awkward looking middle starter evolutions. A short trip north brings me to Floroma, where I'm given a spray duck to water some plants, but I don't need that, I've got a real duck right here. Over in front of the Valley Windworks, I'm able to catch a Weasel. It's then time to take on Commander Mars. Mars leads with a Zubat, but on turn 1, uses U-Turn, which instantly switches her into Perugly. I follow suit and switch into my Psyduck, and then use Disable. This locks Perugly out from using Scratch, which is its strongest move. Following this, I can safely switch into Prinplup and begin using Charm, which eventually lowers Perugly to minus 6 attack. After using one workup, Prinplup can clean up the rest of the fight with Water Gun, giving me a relatively easy win over Mars. It's then onwards to Route 205, where I'm able to catch Shellos, who I nickname Slurm. After escorting everyone's favourite liability, Cheryl, through the Eterna Forest, I finally reach Eterna City. It's here that I'm able to obtain the Explorer Kit, and I spend ages exploring the Sinnoh Underground. There's lots of cool looking areas here, but I couldn't find any new water type Pokemon. After returning to the surface, it's time for the next gym, and to prepare, I evolved Magikarp into Gyarados, and also realised that I forgot an encounter. I backtracked all the way to Route 201, where I was able to catch a Beedoo. Soon after, at level 15, it evolved into a B-Barrel who now gains a water typing. Gardenia looks like a friendly gym leader, but don't be fooled. This demonic harlot exists solely to ruin the day of any unsuspecting water trainer that wanders into her sights. Going up against a Roserade this early absolutely horrifies me. I have a plan, but it requires lots of luck, so I made sure to send plenty of prayers to RNGesus before the battle. 
I lead with Psyduck, who opens up his trench coat to flash Cherubi, lowering its accuracy. That one vibing Cherry in the back doesn't really seem to mind, and I quickly lower its accuracy to minus 6. It can't really hit me now, so I switch into Prinplup. I then begin setting up with Workup to raise my offense, reaching plus 6 attack. From here, a single peck is enough to pluck those cherries. Turtwig is next, but I'm faster, and a single peck takes it down. Last is Roserade. For whatever reason, it went for Stun Spore, but fortunately missed. One last boosted peck finishes the fight, giving me the win. Roserade would have needed a crit to KO me from full health, so I don't feel too bad about Stun Spore missing. That strat was heavily RNG based, but I didn't mind taking the risk since it was still really early in the run. The risk paid off, and I can now move on to the Galactic Eterna building, where I'll be battling with Jupiter. I lead with B-Barrel, and use Defense Curl. I'm poisoned, but came prepared for this as my Petuberry heals this straight away. By using Rollout after Defense Curl, its power is doubled, finishing Zubat in one turn. Skuntank is much bulkier, but since rollout damage increases with each hit, two shots is enough to take Skuntank out. Kneel before your king, Jupiter. It's a vent that exchanges air from the underground. Huh, so you're telling me that if someone were to cover this, you'd suffocate in the underground? <laughs> a short time later, I make it to Heart Home, but there's something really unsettling about the placement of this bed. Psyduck, come on, hurry up, I need to record this video. Daffy is laying down on its back. Uh, are you sure? Boo. <laughs> In the city, my rival ambushes me. His Grottle is a little difficult. It's bulky and uses Curse which buffs its stats. I use Prinplup's Charm to nerf its offense before slowly grinding away with Bubble Beam. The rest of his team don't pose too much of a threat and overall it's a pretty clean win. When an immovable object meets an unstoppable force, my god, the power. Here I'm able to pick up the Good Rod and now it's time for a little fishing trip. On Route 208, I reel in a Barboach. I decided to sub it into the team for Shellos, as its ground typing will give me a nice way of countering electric types, and it also forms a really good core with Gyarados. Then on Route 209, I'm able to catch a Goldeen that I nicknamed Klaus. On my way to Veilstone, I have a really close call with a Kadabra that crits my B-Barrel, but make it through safely to Veilstone City. There's a big shopping district here, and I spent nearly all of my money on TMs and fashion. I then move onwards to clear the path to Pastoria, as the next two gyms have the same level cap. On the way, Weasel evolved into Floatzel, and with the map now opened up, I can get a bunch of encounters. On Route 213, I'm able to catch a Wind Goal that I name. Mine? Then in Pastoria, I can fish up a Remoraid. On Route 212, I catch a Wooper. And finally, in the Great March, I catch Mickey Mouse the Marrow, and it has the huge power ability too, which is a big plus. Back to Veilstone. After reorganizing my team, I was ready to take on Maylene and her fighting type Jim. I lead with Mickey. Metatite sets up a light screen, but this is completely irrelevant as I hit it with a physical play rough for the KO. Play rough only has a 90% accuracy, but I've given Azumarill the wide lens which will increase its accuracy to try and counter this. Machoke is outsped and can't handle the intensity of Mickey, instantly falling to one play rough. Last is Lucario, and its steel typing makes it neutral to Fairy. It uses bulk up on turn 1, which is really bad as play rough is now no longer a 2 hit KO. On the next turn, it lowers my defense with Screech, and was planning to switch into Gyarados who knows Bulldoze, but Azumarill landed a crit at the perfect time. Earlier prayers to RNGs are still paying off. I got a lucky crit there, but in the end, it was very clean. Unfortunately, I did end up overleveling Azumarill and Prinplop, so they'll have to sit out the next gym battle against Crash Awake of Pastoria City. It's a showdown for the title of the best water trainer in all of Sinnoh, and I feel ready to take the crown. Side note, are these his eyebrows or his hair? I have no idea. We both lead with Gyarados, but as it turns out, Gyarados can learn Thunderbolt for whatever reason. I quickly electrify his Gyarados in two turns, giving me a very quick KO. Next is Quagsire, and I continue the mirror match by switching into my own Quag. I use Toxic to badly poison his, and then switch into Gastrodon, who I've equipped to stall with Protect and Recover. It takes a little bit of time, but ultimately, his Quagsire goes down with little risk. Last is Floatzel. Due to Gastrodon's Storm Drain ability, Floatzel can't use two of its water moves. It's non-threatening without these, so I can slowly whittle away its health with Ancient Power while Recover keeps me healthy. Floatzel falls in a display that establishes my water type dominance, and with that, I've earned the fourth badge. Before I can leave the city, my rival shows up again, but I quickly remind him who wears the pants in this rivalry. Then an adult gives me some pills to feed some Pokemon. Yeah, okay, that sounds reasonable. This lets me travel onwards to Celestic Town. After my comically small snake and I take care of Team Galactic, the Town Elder gives me some Surf TMs, which is the greatest gift possible for a Water-type team. After heading back to Heart Home, I can challenge the 5th Gym. 
Fantina has some strong ghost types, but I do have a plan to deal with her, and it starts with this doofus right here. On the first turn, B-Barrel outspeeds Driftblim and lands a Yawn. I'm burned in the process with Will-O-Wisp, but this really isn't a problem as I switch to Gyarados on the next turn when Driftblim falls asleep. I then set up a substitute and begin setting up Dragon Dance. Driftblim wakes up, but since it takes two turns to break my substitute, I'm free to set up more Dragon Dancers, bringing my attack to plus three. From here, Driftblim goes down to one waterfall and I have plenty of HP to survive its aftermath ability. Next is Gengar, but my stat buffs allow me to outspeed it and knock it out in one turn with Waterfall. Its cursed body ability didn't activate, but even if it did, I have Crunch in my moveset for Miss Magius, which also goes down very quickly. That strat was a little bit cheesy, but I'm pulling no punches in my revenge tour of the Sinnoh region. Now with access to Surf, I can cross Route 218, where I catch Squillion the Tentacool. The end of this route brings me to Canaleve City, where my rival is waiting to ambush me. His team doesn't pose too much of a threat once I get Gyarados out in the rain, and I quickly clean him up without too much trouble. This clues me to head over to the Canaleve Gym to tackle Byron and his Steel types. I've put together a plan that requires my starter, so I bench Quagsire to make room and evolve my Primplup into an Empoleon. It's now a Water and Steel Pokemon, which is an absolutely awesome typing. Against Byron, I lead with Empoleon and immediately set up Stealth Rocks. Two of Byron's Pokemon have the sturdy ability, but this Stealth Rock will make that a non-factor. After weakening Bronzor and stalling out the Trick Room turns, my plan is to set up Rain with Pelipper before switching into Float Cell. But there's a problem. Bronzor knows Sandstorm and uses this to override my Rain. As such, my workaround is to first switch into B-Barrel and use Yawn to put it to sleep. The thing is, Byron switched into Steelix, so instead, Steelix was the one put to sleep. After switching into Pelipper to set up the Rain with Drizzle, I can U-turn into Float Cell. The combo of Surf, Rain, and Choice Specs is incredibly powerful, and from here, Float Cell sweeps the remainder of Byron's team. Lucky you've already got your shovel there, you'll need that to bury your entire team. That's badge number 6, and my team is really picking up some momentum. Team Galactic have literally blown up a lake, so it's my job to issue the swift hand of justice. Saturn gets slapped around pretty quickly, as does Commander Mars in our rematch. A long journey through the Sinnoh snow brings me to Snowpoint City for a showdown with the Ice-type gym leader, Candace. I lead with Empoleon. I know that I'm faster than Snova, and knock it out with one Choice Specs boosted Flash Cannon. Sneasel's next, and I tried to outsmart Candace, but it didn't really work. Sneasel's only decent move against Empoleon is Dig. To play around this, I was going to switch into Gyarados with the intention of setting up a Dragon Dance, but Sneasel went for Hone Claws. Candace got greedy though, and used one more Hone Claws, which allowed me to set up a Dragon Dance. Since I now outspeed, I can use one boosted Waterfall to pick up the KO. Next up is Metacham, and I'm in range of a crit rock slide, so I switch into Gastrodon. I land big damage with Earth Power, and then switch back into Gyarados on the Brick Break, landing an Intimidate. I did have to risk a crit anyway, but Gyarados just hung on. However, Gyarados is about to fall to the hail damage. Psych, my Citrus Berry heals some HP, but I did get flinched. I pivot into Pelipper via B-Barrel, as Pelipper won't live two rock slides. I do survive one, and at this range, a single wing attack can finally finish off Metacham. I wanted Pelipper in versus Abomasnow, as I can be certain that it won't go for Earthquake as I U-turn into Empoleon. From here, one Choice Specs Flash Cannon should finish Abomasnow, but this gets complicated when Abomasnow sets up Aurora Veil. I can no longer one-shot Abomasnow, and a crit Earthquake would be deadly. My goal is to stall out the Aurora Veil. I do this by pivoting my team around to bait out Earthquake, only for these to fall on my flying Pokemon, as well as Blizzard onto my non-flying types. A switch into Pelipper, as Aurora Veil wears off, allows me a safe U-turn into Empoleon, who eats a blizzard like a bowl of frosted flakes. From here, I can resume with my original plan, and one choice Specs Flash Cannon finishes the fight. That fight got really messy, but my team was unscathed, and with that, I've earned badge number 7. It's not about winning or losing. That's a uh, very bold coming from someone who has done nothing but lose this entire run. Over the next section of the game, I battle with a small army of galactic grunts, but things don't really heat up until I make it to Spear Pillar. Oh god, it's possessed! Help me! After Cyrus summons the god of time, I take on a double battle versus Mars and Jupiter. This one's always dicey, as my rival leads with a very underwhelming Munchlax. I go with Gyarados, and my plan is to set up Dragon Dance. I'm holding a Personberry to nullify the Confuse Ray, and it works pretty well as my opponents focus on Munchlax for the most part. Once I'm at plus 3, I begin targeting Jupiter's Pokemon, but due to Reflect, Skuntank just lives a waterfall. My rival took out the other Bronzor, meaning that both Ace Pokemon are on the field at the same time. I can take Skuntank down with another waterfall, but Perugly does big damage with Body Slam, so I have to switch out. 
although the last few Pokemon aren't very threatening and I can clean up the rest of the battle with Empoleon and Pelipper. The little man Cyrus then steps up to the plate, but I've prepared a fine selection of cheese for my strategy here. He leads with Honchkrow, but I quickly take it down with two waterfalls. Cyrus then sends in his own Gyarados, and this is where my plan comes to life. I pivot my team in a way that allows me to land multiple Intimidates with Gyarados basically for free. This can be achieved by switching into Empoleon. The AI will then try for a super effective Earthquake, but this lets me bring Gyarados in for free while lowering Cyrus's attack. With this strategy, I was able to nerf Gyarados into the ground. From here, I'm completely free to set up three Dragon Dancers, and with these boosts, I can clear through the rest of Cyrus's team very cleanly. I was feeling confident and faced up to the Time God himself. Gastrodon does big damage with an Earth Power, but on the next turn, a Roar of Time absolutely eviscerates my poor Pokemon. At this range, one Surf from Floatzel can clean up the last sliver of Dialga's health. We'd save the day, but at what cost? No one has the right to take away anyone's future, yet tell that to my dead slug. With Gastrodon's lifeless body in hand, I descended Mount Coronet before giving it a proper send-off. Rest easy, Slurm. You did good. A short trip through Route 222 brings me to Sunny Shore City for the final gym. This one specializes in electric Pokemon, which sounds scary, right? The Grass Gym gave us a lot of trouble, so this one should too. Well, not exactly. We've got a lot more Pokemon, items, and moves available now. Volkner needs a fiery battle to lift his spirits, and oh boy have I got just the thing. I lead with Wishcash and begin buffing my special defense with Amnesia. Raichu can only hit me with Surf, allowing me to reach plus 6. I've taken some damage though, so use Rest to recover, but my Chesto Berry wakes me up immediately. A few Earthquakes then take care of Raichu. Ambipom is next, and this guy is a real pain. It can combo double hit with its Technician ability to deal some insane damage. I have to switch, but pivot carefully to take advantage of my ground type's immunity to electric attacks. First into Gyarados for Intimidate, and then into Quagsire on the Thunderbolt, then into Pelipper to set up Rain, and then back into Quagsire on another Thunderbolt. Finally, then into Empoleon. At this range, one Rain Boosted Aqua Jet can finally KO Ambipom. Octillery has some good coverage in its moveset, but it isn't overly threatening. A switch into Quagsire lets me put it to sleep with Yawn, before Floatzel finishes it off with two Choice Specs boosted Surfs. Last is Luxray, and the pivoting continues. Eventually, I switch into Quagsire and land a Toxic, badly poisoning Luxray. A mixture of Protect, as well as pivoting between Gyarados and Quagsire, allows me to stall as Luxray eventually succumbs to the poison. That win gives me the final Gym Badge, and Volkner was thrilled with our match. I think this is the first time that anyone has ever enjoyed being toxic stalled, but to each their own. A short surf across Route 223, and one Mantike later, and I'd made it to Victory Road. I stepped carefully, making sure to avoid the optional battles, safely making it through with no casualties. I'd finally made it to the Pokemon League, but my rival ambushes me and wants one last L, so let's deliver that. I lead with Choice Specs Float Cell and hit a big Ice Beam, but Staraptor survives due to its Focus Sash. It does set up Sunny Day, but falls on the very next turn. For whatever reason, he then sends out his Torterra, and this is perfect for me. A single 4 times effective Ice Beam absolutely demolishes it. I have to switch against Rapidash though, as Choice Specs locks me into Ice Beam. I go with Pelipper, as its ability will replace the harsh sunlight with rain. A Water Pulse falls just short of getting the KO, but after recovering some HP with Roost, I'm able to finish Rapidash off with a U-turn, which lets me bring out Gyarados against Heracross. Heracross sets up Swords Dance, and this means that Rock Slide could do big damage to Gyarados. As such, I switch into Empoleon, and I use Flash Cannon, followed by the Priority Aqua Jet, allowing me to take down Heracross. Next up is Snorlax, and this guy can be deadly. I expect an Earthquake, so switch into Gyarados for a free Intimidate, before going with Quagsire. After landing a Toxic, I stall out the Poison by pivoting, giving me a very clean KO in the end. Last is Float Cell, but two Thunderbolts from Gyarados cleans it up, giving my rival one last L to hold. It's been real, Magma. Before I go any further, there was one more Pokemon that I wanted to find. Everyone's favorite beauty, Feebas. Feebas appears on four random water tiles while fishing in Mount Coronet. It's pure RNG, but I was determined. Alright, I'm over it, fishing trip's done. I fished for five hours and didn't find a single one. But as I floated there among my own impatience and salt, I did have time to put together a plan for the Elite Four, and this was the team of champions that was going to get me the crown. 
My revenge tour on the Sinnoh Pokemon League begins right here. Aaron's team of bugs are just begging to be squished, so I've devised a plan to do just that. Pelipper is my lead, and it runs a deadly combo that goes something like this. Hurricane is a hard-hitting flying-type move that doesn't miss in the rain. Pelipper's ability sets up the rain, and I've also given it the choice specs. This deadly concoction turns my Pelipper into a stone-cold killer, sweeping through Aaron's first four Pokémon with its super-effective Hurricane. Drapion could take Pelipper down, so I switch into Empoleon who is immune to Cross Poison, then into Gyarados who won't be hit by Earthquake. After a single Dragon Dance, one Earthquake of my own is enough to finish the fight, and we can now move on to the next Elite Four member, Bertha. Bertha is much better than she was in the original games, but I've got a plan to exploit her bulky ground types. Her Quagsire has physical, special, and status moves, so it isn't easy to set up on. To get around this, I lead with B-Barrel and use Yawn to put Quagsire to sleep. On the following turn, I set up Stealth Rocks to prevent Golem's sturdy ability from activating. I then switch into my own Quagsire, and use another Yawn as Bertha's wakes up from its nap. From here, I switch into Gyarados on the Earthquake from Quagsire is free, and I can now begin setting up with Dragon Dance. I'm poisoned in the process, but my Petra Berry heals this. Now at plus 5 attack, and speed, Bertha's team is absolutely shattered by the almighty Gyarados. It was definitely not pretty, but it was effective. That's Bertha done. Flint is meant to be a Fire-type trainer, but this team is a real mixed bag. Fortunately for me, his Rapidash lead is very exploitable. This fight begins the same as the last one. B-Barrel puts Rapidash to sleep with Yawn, and sets up Stealth Rock. This will be important later on. A switch into Gyarados allows me to set up once more with Dragon Dance. I had a Chesto Berry in case Rapidash went for Hypnosis, but it never did, and I raised my stats to plus 3, pretty much uncontested. From here, Rapidash goes down to a Waterfall, as does Steelix, as does Larpany, and as does Drifblim. Infernape is holding a Focus Sash, but the Stealth Rocks that I set up earlier nullifies this, and with one more Waterfall, Flint goes down in an embarrassing display. Lucian's team has access to Screens, Trick Room, and a deadly Alakazam, which can make it difficult to navigate. But, I think Empoleon is just the penguin for the job. As Mr. Mime sets up Light Screen and Reflect, I begin by using Swords Dance on Empoleon. Since Mr. Mime's two attacking moves are not very effective against Empoleon, I'm free to max my attack. However, as it's holding the Light Clay, Reflect will last for 8 turns, so I also use Protect to help stall this out. For my plan to work, it's vital that I remove Mr. Mime just as Reflect ends, which I successfully do. My maxed attack, combined with the Mystic Water that I'm holding, means that I can sweep through Lucian's first four Pokémon with Aqua Jet. My Empoleon is pretty slow, but Aqua Jet has a plus one priority, meaning it will land before any of Lucian's moves, regardless of my speed. Bronzong is last, and it's very bulky, but it is also slower than me. As such, I can land a super effective Shadow Claw to finish it off in one shot. It's a clean sweep, and my team had made it through the Elite Four unscathed. But Cynthia still remained, and her team was by far the scariest. It's balanced, full of incredibly strong Pokémon with perfect natures, and stats through the roof. I had a score to settle with Cynthia, and this is a team that I believe can get the job done. Leading with B-Barrel, I first use Amnesia. This buffs my special defense by four stages thanks to my simple ability, meaning that Spiritomb can barely touch me. This buys me plenty of time to set up Yawn and Stealth Rock. With Spiritomb asleep, I switch into Gyarados and set up two Dragon Dancers. Once Spiritoon wakes up, I have to attack, and a Waterfall takes it down. Cynthia sends Gastrodon out next, and this squishy slug is an absolute wall. I can't simply overpower it, so after some deliberation, I decided on another approach. Quagsire is a bulky boy who can easily withstand Gastrodon's attacks. It takes ages, but after using Toxic to badly poison Gastrodon, a mixture of pivoting my team around, as well as Protect, eventually spells the end of that slug. Naturally, Cynthia sends out her Roserade, and she is just itching to rip my team apart with Energy Ball. It's crucial that I get a clean switch into Pelipper, so someone has to fall on the sword. And the lucky winner is... B-Barrel. Seriously, B-Barrel was awesome in this run and did a great job. Rest easy, friend. Pelipper just survives a Sludge Bomb, before delivering a big hurricane to blow away the very threatening Roserade. Sadly, he did succumb to poison, but my god, he died a hero. Pelipper's last gift was setting up the rain. I send out Floatzel, as Cynthia goes into Lucario. Normally it would be faster, but Pelipper's rain also activates Floatzel's ability. The doubled speed, combined with my choice specs, lets me fire off a very powerful Surf, ending Lucario instantly. 
this brings Milo Tick to the fray, and I'm still a little annoyed that I couldn't find a Feebas of my own. Anyway, Milo Tick is bulky like Gastrodon, but it's even harder to deal with. It can use Recover to heal its HP, and is holding the Flame Orb. Not only does this activate its Marvel Scale ability, but this also means that I can't poison Milo Tick since it's already burned. I need to preserve Float Cell, so switch into Empoleon, who should have a much better time of tanking Milo Tick's hits. By cycling Protect and Sword Stance, I slowly drain Milo Tick's PP while buffing my stats. Once at plus 6, I begin using Shadow Claw, but this thing is so bulky. I manage to lower its HP and try to finish the job with an Aqua Jet, but Cynthia full restores. However, just at the right time, Empoleon dodges an attack out of sheer love, which lets me land one final Aqua Jet to pick up a very big KO. Garchomp is last, but a single insanely boosted Aqua Jet is enough to take it down. However, in one final act of cowardice, its rough skin ability depleted the last of Empoleon's health. I'd gotten the win, but my beloved starter had fallen right on the finish line. With that, I'd beaten my first hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and did it using only water types. The Elite Four is insanely tough, but there are some great water types out there with some really cool combos to help you deal with them. Before you go, make sure you leave a like on the video, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. It's completely free, but it really does help me out. If you want more Pokemon Challenge runs, check out one of these. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.